it, um, it may be too early to be quoting Albert Einstein, but it's in your program, so I'm going to do it anyway, uh, which where he says, uh, if I had one hour to save the world, I'd spend 59 minutes defining what the problem is and one minute solving it. Uh, and I just was really struck by that uh, when I read the program and I was listening to the discussion last night about TRE talking about healthcare systems around the world. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about the National Health Service where the problem that they were trying to solve there in 1948 when they started that, that system was they had enormous disparities in health outcomes based on social class. And they thought that if they provided uh, high quality free medical care to every, every citizen that they would be able to address that problem. And uh, what you found was a pr pretty famous report in 1980, um, the, the black report that showed that over 30 years, the, the health of the country had improved for sure, but that disparity, the difference between those of the low social class and high social class did not change that much. And in fact, another report in 1998, the Atchison report, confirmed the findings of the black report. And so it really, really calls into question, I think, this idea that focusing on health care is really the answer to, fall, to solve some of these health disparities. So that's one idea I just wanted to throw out at the beginning here. The other thing I wanted to say too is I am super nervous to be here. I am not, I don't like public speaking and, uh, and I, we have done several of these conferences. Uh, the Federal Reserve um, uh, has partnered with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Federal Reserve has a, a deep commitment to anti-poverty work and community revitalization through our community development program. We, all the reserve banks across the country have this function uh, and we hold, we've held 15 conferences bringing together the people who worry about community revitalization and uh, uh, anti-poverty work together with the people who do population health and public health and the social determinants of health. And usually these conferences go very well, but sometimes they don't. And usually when they don't, it's when I'm in a kind of a really hardcore medical setting. And I just want to tell you this quick story that where the last time I had this experience was uh, at the Cleveland Clinic. And, um, and I wouldn't say I got into a fight. I don't think it, that's quite fair to say, but it was tense. It was kind of tense. And uh, the idea, the, the focus of the conference was how can we improve the health of, the, of Cleveland. And uh, the person who got on before me was a, a orthopedic, or sorry, cardiac surgeon uh, from the Cleveland Clinic. And um, he, and I don't mean to pick up on pick on surgeons all the time. I think we already that was already started this morning. But um, I like surgeons. I'm married to a pediatrician. I'm a big fan of of the healthcare system. But uh, he got up there and uh, he he said, you know, look, if we're going to improve health, everyone's got to take some responsibility for this. And then you need a pedometer. You need a workout buddy. You need to really pay attention to the data on your health. You need to know what your five normals are and really manage that. You know. And, and I got on afterwards and I thought, and it's not that common that I follow someone and I say, well, I totally disagree with you, but I kind of did that in this case. And, and I said, you know, look, I, I just bought health insurance, or not, not health, life insurance, um, and they sent out a, a nurse and they did a thousand different tests and it turns out that I'm, I'm in very good health, as it happens. And, um, and I uh, explained to, to the surgeon, I said, I don't have a pedometer, I don't have a workout buddy, I don't even know what the five normals are, much less what my scores are in them. But I was trying to explain to him, I said, you know, I think I have a different theory of why I'm healthy, and that's because I think I live in a community and in a neighborhood that supports my health. And I explained to the audience that I have access to nutritious food at a good price at a green grocer, not just a couple blocks from my house. I have a park and recreational opportunities nearby. I have, there's a reasonably good public transportation system in, in San Francisco where I live and I walk to that station every day to and from that takes me to my work. Um, I have, I know my neighbors, we're not all great friends, but you know, we, we can rely on each other in a pinch. Um, I have a community of friends and family that check in on me. And, and what I was trying to explain was that I really feel as though it's my neighborhood and my community that keeps me healthy. And that's something that not all Americans can experience, that they don't live in communities that do that. And that's really the focus of community development in some respects. And let me jump into my presentation here. So defining the problem, as Einstein says, well, I would define the problem as the fact that we are spending uh, more on medical care than anyone else in the world, and we have worse health and shorter lives. And this is true even for wealthy people. Those of you who read The Spirit Level will know that the middle class Swede is, is, as healthy as a, is healthier than a wealthy American. And so this is a real problem for all, for all of us. Um, this is a, just an example that shows that countries who spend uh, half of what we do on medical care have higher and better health outcomes than we do. Um, and, and really, I put this slide in as a, a, a part also just to dra dramatize how much money is, is in the system. 
Um, this problem is getting worse in some respects. In, in, in 1980, uh, we, were, we ranked 18th in the world in infant mortality. By, by, by 2009, that we had slipped to 31st. Um, and that really makes me sort of wonder, what are the things, what are the levers that we can f push to try to increase the health uh, and improve the health of the nation. And I, really that's sort of taken me to think more deeply about the social determinants of health. And here's just one of the studies of the, this massive literature that's out there about what it is that affects our health, how we live our lives, how it affects our health. And this is one that McGinnis, the McGinnis study talking about the contributions of premature death. And you might think if you were, um, if you died before your time, that might be you had um, lack of access to health care or maybe you had bad health care. But it turns out that only explained about 10% of the cases that they, they analyzed in this study. More, a much bigger percentage was the result of environmental exposure, behavioral patterns, and social circumstances. Um, basically, the things that happen in your neighborhood uh, and in the community that, where you live. Uh, and, and if you think about it, the 30% the is a genetic predisposition. You might think of that's just the luck of the draw, but we don't have time to go into sort of theories around epigenetics, but you can imagine that the sort of the toxic stress and the kind of env environment that you live in actually can turn on and off those genes uh, that, and, and, and really promote worse health outcomes even in that genetics uh, slice of the pie. So, so really we're, we're talking about if we're going to move the lever, uh, we, not, we might not need to start thinking differently about how to do that. And, and I think one of the things that really sort of encapsulates this uh, is uh, and was, was given voice by the Robert Wood Johnson Commission to Build a Healthier America where uh, they, they, they coined this phrase, your zip code is more important than your genetic code for your health. I think that's pretty dramatic that your zip code is more important than your genetic code for your health. Now the way this plays out is, 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 is similar in cities across the country. This is a metro map of Washington, D.C. Those brightly colored lines are the metro lines. You'll see that uh, life expectancy around stations uh, in the center of, of the city are about 77 years. That puts you in the, rank, in the international rankings somewhere with Uruguay and Peru. Um, if you're in the suburbs, uh, in the, some places that are, that, that are more functioning neighborhoods, more viable neighborhoods in many respects, you find that life expectancy is, is 84 years. That's higher than Iceland and Japan, the countries with the longest life uh, expectancy in the world. This plays out in communities across the country. This is, this is a map of New Orleans where the life expectancy differences between two neighborhoods in very close proximity is 25 years, which is really remarkable. And you might think that these two cities, maybe they're, they're, they're famously poorly run or they have real uh, serious troubles with race relations and whatnot. Um, but even when we did this conference at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, um, we, uh, Robert Johnson did one of these maps that showed on Interstate 94 the life expectancy from different uh, freeway exits on that, on that road through the, city, through the Twin Cities and found within a three mile difference a 13 year life dis uh, a discrepancy in life expectancy. So the point I'm trying to get to here is I think you know, there's, there are ways in which um, we can create environments that promote health, uh, in part because you know, this, this, this recognition uh, that, 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 that I've come to and many of my colleagues have come to, which is this idea, it's a different way of thinking about health, that is that our bodies are the sum record of our challenges and opportunities, and too many of our fellow citizens are, are living in environments that are overly challenging to them. But I don't want to be such a downer. I mean, this is the first presentation of the day, and he's like, oh, you don't need another Jeremiah to sort of about this kind of stuff. I think there's, there's a lot of hope on this topic, and I want to share a little bit of that with you. Um, part of it is really focusing on what, uh, what is being done in the community development field. This is a field you may not know, um, but it's doing remarkable work around the country, and I just want to give you a quick uh, summary of it. Um, this is a book I wrote um, a few years ago called The Housing Policy Revolution, Networks and Neighborhoods. I stole that subtitle from Neurons and Neighborhoods, the NIH report. But uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a history of community development. Um, and and it, this, is a, this is an industry that comes out of the war on poverty in many respects, the Model Cities program and things like that. It's a successor to that. Uh, but it's actually been, uh, it's, it's been very successful. It's, 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 it's large in scale. It, it doesn't quite meet the need, uh, but it's about $20 billion a year in subsidies um, from the federal government. Uh, there's, there's subsidies from state and local government as well. A lot of philanthropic money comes into this. The Ford Foundation, Rockefeller, uh, MacArthur Foundation spend, uh, uh, donate quite a bit to this industry. Uh, it levers, uh, that subsidy money levers uh, a tremendous amount of bank capital from uh, banks motivated by the community 
Community Reinvestment Act of 1977, that number is well north of $100 billion a year. So your annual expenditures uh, well over $120 billion into low-income neighborhoods all across the country. It primarily builds affordable housing uh, that's service enriched, also provides capital to small businesses, um, finances uh, uh, community facilities, the facilities that make communities more viable, whether it's a school, a clinic, a grocery store, and a school in a, in a food desert. But it does this in a really interesting way in that it harmonizes multiple funding sources. It brings together in these very complex financial transactions, subsidy dollars, philanthropic dollars, market rate, uh, capital market dollars, together in these transactions that, uh, that is really transformative. And the other key about community development is it's got very local roots. It's often, uh, the lead organization is often a community development corporation. Um, a CDC, as we call it, in these meetings, we, we bring health together with community developers. Uh, that's, always a, that's always a subject of confusion. Where we say CDC, we think Community Development Corporation. You guys often think of someplace in Atlanta, but that's, that's another story. But uh, these, um, these, the other thing that community development is able to do is really create these cross-sector linkages, uh, not just in community development, but with uh, other sectors, health, education, uh, and, and, and the like. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few of these examples. This is, uh, this is an affordable housing project in San Francisco. San Francisco is an unusual place for a lot of reasons, and that's why I like to live there. But it's, uh, in this case, it's a city and a county. And a lot of times, the money that goes to community development and community revitalization goes through city budgets. And then the health for, 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 for low-income people often goes through county budgets, through the, cent through the, through the general hospitals. San Francisco made a, a, a gamble that they built a lot of supportive uh, housing, that is, uh, affordable housing for formerly homeless people with a lot of social services and case management managers and nurse practitioners and whatnot, that they might be able to save money at, their, at the general hospital because these were high users of the emergency department there. Uh, it turned out to be a tremendous success for the city. Uh, and this is something that's, that, that many, many other communities are trying to replicate. Uh, community development has built 3 million uh, homes for low-income families, uh, housing about 10 million low-income Americans. That's more housing than in, is in existence from all the other federal building programs dating back to 1937 when the federal government got in that job. There's small business, I mentioned small business, some, but the, some of the small businesses that you see finance are really creative and transformative, and this is an example of that. Um, you see here, and this is called Market Creek Plaza, it's in San Diego. Um, this was an area that was, uh, it was former industrial site, it was very hef heavily contested by rival gangs. Uh, the Jacobs Family Foundation decided they wanted to make a difference here uh, and, and transform this, this community. And they sent out some, some, some people early on to the organizers and said, and it started meeting with the gangs and basically said, what, what, we want this to be a violence-free zone. What, what do we need to do? What do we need to provide to, 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 to get that? And the leaders of the gangs responded to that and said, uh, we want jobs for our members. And so the Jacobs Family Foundation said, we're going to provide that. And in partnership with Wells Fargo and J.P. Morgan Chase and, and um, uh, Citibank and another, others, uh, through the financing through the New Markets Tax Credit, about a $5 billion a year program that subsidizes small business, they were able to cobble together the, the financing for this really transformative project. And you see many of the people who live in this neighborhood are from southern Mexico and they have a real strong tie to their Mayan past. So you see the architecture reflects that. Um, you, there's got a community amphitheater. There is a grocery store here uh, in what was formerly a food desert. There's a, there's a Wells Fargo branch. Uh, that's doing its best to inc uh, get people into the financial mainstream, get them out of the check cashing business and the, and, and the payday lending business, uh, businesses that are nearby. Community development also finances schools, and so I just think, you know, just really want to underscore, uh, this is uh, the Knowledge is Power program, a, a really fantastic charter school organization founded by two uh, Teach for America alums. And uh, I just think, I'm just, I, you just look at these pictures. I mean, this is something you, a kid walks through the doors of that school every day and they, they, the message that is sent to him or her is you live in a society that cares about you and wants you to su succeed. So at Rue, what we're really trying to do is attack the corrosive effects of poverty and poor health on, uh, using community development. And I think this is a really powerful union. In fact, in this book I mentioned before, what works, investing in what works for America's communities, Risa Lavizo More, the president of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, has an essay in there. And she concludes it by saying, um, we're going to look back at this, in the near future, we're going to look back on this time and wonder why community development and health were ever separate to begin with. 
And in fact, when we do have these conferences, here's uh, the, uh, Jonathan Fielding, the director of the uh, public health department in LA County did these maps for us. We try to do these heat maps that show something of concern for the community developer, something like poverty, overcrowding housing, unemployment, and what are the neighborhoods that light up of concern for that. And then we do a similar map for the health folks. What, what, where, what's the um, prevalence of childhood obesity or uh, uh, type 2 diabetes or asthma or what have you? And what we find, and this is, in this instance, it's, it's, this is economic hardship on your left and prevalence of uh, childhood obesity on your right, you'll find that in almost all cases, and we do this all around the country, those maps are the same map. We're working side by side uh, in these communities. But we need more coordination, and that's hard not the least of which is the language issue I alluded to before about CDCs, but it's also trying to figure out new business models and how to sort of incorporate new uh, d different approaches to spending, uh, 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 finance. But this is a first step, actually. This is, I think this is, I think we're gonna to bring together health and community development as that'll be the nucleus, but we need to bring in other allied sectors as well because, you know, we had this, this first of these conferences in uh, Washington, D.C. Melody Barnes, was, she was director of the Domestic Policy Council, and she said, look, you don't wake up in the morning and have a transportation day, and then the next day you have an affordable housing day, and the next day you have an education day. Everything is an everything day. And we are not yet capable from the institutional side of things to execute on a cross-sector um, intervention in these communities to make them more health-promoting, but we're getting there. And I would say that this is something that we all have a stake in. This is some, these, are, these are health outcome disparities by income quartile, by black, Hispanic, and whites. You see dramatic differences between low income uh, members of all those racial groups and the higher incomes. This is a problem for everybody. It's a problem for companies that are searching to tr create the most productive workforces, workforce in the world and, 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 and in a time when globalization is putting pressure on them. And there's a real uh, demographic imperative here. You'll see that um, the number of people who are uh, over 65 will double in the next 40 years. And if those people enter into, adult, uh, into older age with uh, a number of health issues that require a lot of medical care, that is going to break the system. In addition to that, even if we address part of that problem, that will so powerfully crowd out funding for other things that that's gonna make things like the sequester look like a picnic. And you find a situation where the, 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 the number of uh, workers per retiree is getting smaller and smaller as we, as, as we get into this era. So that in 1970, it was 3.6 per, per retiree, 3.6 workers. In 2010, it was 2.8. By 2030, it's gonna be 1.9. And one of those two workers is gonna be black or Latino. And I, as somebody who's gonna be, I hope I can retire in that time, we wanna make sure every single one of those workers is as productive as they possibly can. If, it, if they aren't, we're all in a lot of trouble. And I would say this is something we don't, we're not gonna to need to spend that much more money on this. I think there's a lot of, um, we, uh, my mantra lately is that the, the status quo is stupid and expensive. I think there's a lot of money being spent on things that are the consequences of poverty and not on the things that are the, at, at, at the front end where we can alleviate some of the negative um, influences of it. So I'm just going to, I'm running out of time here, so I'm just going to summarize what I think some of the next steps are. One is there's some real breakthroughs in uh, pay for success financing. You see things like the social impact bond. The first one of these was uh, Rikers Island's social impact bond in New York City, a, 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 a partnership between the city of New York, the Bloomberg Foundation, and Goldman Sachs, where they are finding ways to uh, spend more money on case management and, 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 and uh, prisoner uh, efforts at trying to keep uh, youth from um, um, returning to prison uh, through through a bunch of interventions on the front end. Um, these uh, these pr we've all heard that prison is expensive. We know that a prison for uh, for someone who is underage is extremely expensive because you also have to run a school inside of the prison. So this is not this. Some, sometimes you'll hear it, prison's more expensive than Harvard. This these prison uh, the, the incarcerating somebody at Rikers Island is something like six times more expensive than Harvard uh, per, per person per year. Um, 
there are some pretty uh, promising changes in the medical care industry, and this is sort of, sort of clearly your, your area, but uh, I, the, the two that I'm focusing a lot on lately are accountable care organizations, where you're paid per person per year to keep somebody healthy, as opposed to paying for per procedure. Um, and I think already we're having interesting conversations with ACOs, and, and, and even some of these sort of mega ACOs called accountable care communities, where they're trying to make investments in neighborhoods to keep people uh, on, uh, out of the doctor's office and on a better health trajectory. The other piece that's really been interesting is the work that nonprofit hospitals are interested in making some of these social determinants of health investments uh, using some of their community benefit dollars. Um, and we've had several meetings along those, those lines. Um, public policy is moving in this direction. You see all kinds of efforts at the, at the federal level where you're trying to um, pierce silos and create these cross-sector interventions so that health and human services is working with housing and urban development, working with EPA, justice, and all the rest to create programs like Promise Neighborhoods, Choice Neighborhoods, sustainable communities, all of which are trying to execute on this collective action vision where you have cross-sector interventions. Um, you have a really interesting work Don Berwick did in the, um, the, on the Triple AIM, uh, the Institute for Healthcare Innovation, or Improvement rather, and uh, here uh, he, Don was talking about the need for, um, oh I'm sorry, and the public policy issue that, that's happening at the local level as well with counties and cities also trying to find ways to integrate their community development, health, and other um, uh, services. And then I, I think we need new institutions, and I mentioned Don Berwick. The, his, his idea of an integrator, I think, is really fascinating. Um, uh, the Strive Network in Cincinnati was trying to work on, uh, they've got 80 net Strive Networks around the country. They're trying to uh, improve the education outcomes. They talk about the need for a backbone organization. Uh, in the book that we wrote, Investing in What Works, uh, we talk about um, the need for a community quarterback that's able to sort of bring some of those pieces together. And I would just say um, that in these instances you have um, uh, really remarkable prototypes. Uh, the Harlem's Children's Zone, pur purpose-built community in Atlanta, Neighborhood Centers Inc. In, in Houston, are really remarkable examples where people are doing cross-sector work. They're data-driven. They are achieving tremendous results. The other piece of this, though, is that in every one of those instances, that you find at the very core of these uh, interventions a super genius who has a close friend who is a billionaire. <laughs> and that we know is not scalable or repl replicable, but we know every community has leaders and we can grow that and foster it, and I know that's something that we can do a better job at. And I think through things like pay for success and some of these other reallocation of resources, I know we can replicate or replace what that billionaire is so that, um, so that your zip code is not your is not destiny, that we have the ideas, the resources, and the ability to make every neighborhood in this country one that is a neighborhood of opportunity and promotes health. So thank you very much. Appreciate you spending time with me this morning. Well, that's it. In the interest of time, I will spare you the full interrogation, but uh, thanks so much. Thank Does Ben Bernanke call you up and go, how are we working on the poverty thing? Have you got that fixed yet? Uh, so he, um, if you want to see Ben's uh, reflections on this effort, uh, Google uh, Bernanke and Creating Resilient Communities. Uh, it was a speech he gave just a few months ago. Really? Yeah. You had a lot of input. We did. Fantastic. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.